Well, welcome to the second event in uh, the Beck Visiting Writers Series this year. I apologize for the heat. I think that the weather has kind of fooled our air conditioning system and, and doesn't know what to do now, so I'll fiddle with it back there and see if I can make it a little better, but, but bear with it. It's a little warm. Uh, it's not you, it is the heat. Uh, but you're in for a great evening. We've got a couple of writers uh, today, both uh, winners of the Great Lakes College Association New Writers Award, and I'm very happy to, to be able to uh, be here to see them both, and I think it'll be a real treat for, for you as, all as well. Uh, we're going to do, let's see, um, Randall Horton is going to be our first uh, writer, and I'm going to introduce him, and then Margot, our own Professor Margot Singer, will be up here to introduce Charles, Bo you say Boyer? Boyer, ah, see, I have a grand bois, I'm a French, so, okay, Charles Boyer. I should have asked that beforehand, I apologize. Okay, um, so we'll, uh, we'll get this thing, we'll get this going. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to introduce Randall Horton. Uh, in Of Note magazine, Sally Ann Hard writes of, of Randall's work. Uh, Randall Horton's poems, because he writes poems as well as, as nonfiction, are the work of a knowing, compassionate witness. He lays out reasons why we should care, why we should be moved to action, and why our treatment of people who are imprisoned is an indictment against our moral, ethical, and societal values. And Randall Horton knows of what he writes, having gone from being homeless to prisoner to professor of English at the University of New Haven. Upon his release from prison in 2001, he earned a PhD in English, creative writing from SUNY Albany, and has since garnered a National Endowment of the Arts Fellowship the Gwendolyn Brooks Poetry Pro Award, the Bia Gonzalez Poetry Award, along with publishing three books of poetry, The Definition of Place, The Lingua Franca of Ninth Street, both from Main Street Rag, and Pitch Dark Anarchy from Tricorderly Press, and two works of nonfiction, Roxbury, and his most recent book, Hook, winner of the Great Lakes College Association New Writers Award for 2017. To give you a sense of the book, I'm going to cite the words of the three-judge panel who decided the prize. And I think this, having been a past judge on this, on this prize, I think <coughs> Professor Singer may speak to this as well. Uh, it's a, it's a, um, there's, there's a lot of quality that goes, a lot of quality books that come, that try for this prize, and a lot of books. And it's a, it's a hard job to go through them all. Uh, and a three-judge panel to get them to agree is, can be difficult. So it has to be a special book. And the three-judge panel said of this prize, Randall Horton's memoir, Hook, is an intriguing modern take on a classic American tale of self-reinvention, as in Horatio Alger's 19th century rags-to-riches stories. Horatio Alger's heroes never become international drug lords and cocaine smugglers, though, although also they never go to jail, exploit prostitutes, or critique paradigms of race and governance in their journal. But, like Horton, they do end up thriving in the very structures that once made them feel marginalized. Randall Horton delivers careful, rough-hewn, poetically charged language at the service of a memoir that runs against the grain of a typical recovery narrative. What results is searing commentary, social critique under the guise of a memoir within a memoir. Because his life has been truly intersectional, from college student to homeless drug addict to international cocaine smuggler to inmate and finally college professor, this text has the potential to speak to people for generations. Through a bravado performance of structure and sentence, Horton gives his readers an unsentimental and important view into how a person works to rebuild after a downward spiral, showcasing how literature can be part of that recovery. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Randall Horton. Hello, how's everybody doing? You all right? Come on, man, let's not be dead here. Um, and so we sort of could write these letters back and forth about the prison industrial complex, about social constructions, about literature, about race, a whole lot of gamuts. Um, and sort of like some of the things that we talk about that, that, and that's there in the memoir are, are mostly flashbacks. And so the flashbacks are presented to this person in mail call. Her name is L. Um, but her, her, he does, she does have a name as Linda Perez, but for the sake of this uh, memoir, at the time it was published, we decided not to publish her name, right? Um, for, for a few reasons. Um, so let me stop talking and read a little bit and I might get back at you. So, journal note to self, dear reader, follow the North Star. 
Erratic remnants of starlight sends unified rooftops within a five block radius. Adjusting our lens farther down into the scope of an urban city, outlines of humans mechanized by societal structures disappear into a hole in the ground and are erased. Calibrating the audio reveals decompressing diesel brakes trudging up the upper west side, car engines idling, even La Pepito selling the times across from the bodega. Location only matters because of conditions that create location. We discourse in dualism, operating under the assumption conditions run parallel, that space interrelates through distant memory. Langston and Gwendolyn, Naruda and, Mo and Morehan, hear the echo on the overground railroad, part metaphor, part homage to Harriet, who would have freed more if they had known they were in bondage. Perhaps we can be new millennium Harriets, create renegade languages, rescuing status quo from language bondage, as in them shackling don't even know it. Traveling through black spac night, snaking around corners into new corners, refusing a final destination, tending to seep through the train synthetic glass pane. 125th Street in block lettering, America appears over the left breastplate of a man in solid blue dress. Uniformity along the aisles, everybody facing north as if something unknown awaits. Amazing grace, the homeless man in the corner with his hand cup for chain belts. How sweet the sound, no one hears, only the drone. Because Hook doesn't exist, 2009 Harlem, New York. Answer the phone at 10 p.m. Off a reserve hello on a nebulous night filled with pallets, snow in Harlem. Respond with, okay. Listen, be attentive when you learn he died in the hell of gunfire at the intersection of Minnesota Avenue and East Capitol Streets in the nation's capital. After thinking that's fucked up, thank your old college roommate for calling. Ignore that he greeted you as Hook, the nickname you went by in the streets, hang up. You can and can't believe the truth simultaneously. Write D-I-S-C-O in your leather journal. Maybe this will immortalize the image. You will never forget him, but you have already forgotten Hook. Before the blackbirds echoes bangs against your windowsill, wake up. Go directly to the mahogany desk between two windows. Sit in the brown swivel chair. Stare at the building opposite your building. Rearrange papers that don't need rearranging twice. Open your journal to the name written last night, Disco. Remember the cell doors opening after serving 18 months for three felonies in Fairfax County Adult Detention Center. Five hours after that release, meet Disco Willing and ATM through your basement on a handcart. Out of the wall with metal chain and pickup truck, he had pulled the money machine. He did that. This is your introduction. Turn on the computer. Type Theodore Blanford in the search box. Click the magnifying glass. Expect to be surprised even though you know what the results will bring. Don't be surprised when you scroll to Maryland double homicide, suspect shot killed in DC. One lone bird outside your window flies backwards at an indeterminate rate of speed while the world moves forward. The bird is red. Look for balance in the oddity. Note that double homicide is five syllables. Five deliberate pauses before, damn. Remember you knew the suspect shoot a killer. Suspend court in your imagination. Add four indeterminate words to formulate the phrase whole court in the streets. This is how he will die, holding court in the streets, prophetic. After reading that the now deceased wife had wanted a divorce, deduced it was because of drugs. Visualize the wife and sister just before death in their devil wide. Try to make sense of blood spilled on the carpet. The red is deafening scream. Wait for the buzzer to stop buzzing because someone rung the wrong buzzer. There's always an echo after the buzzing. Even after it buzzes again, don't answer it. It is not for you. Keep reading the online article, but more specifically the phrases forcible entry and protective order. Acknowledge that your friend was a suspect in his first wife's murder too, a dead body in the trunk. Two days later while driving to school to teach, call short man because it takes that long to find someone to talk about tragedy. Tell short man who is a barber and has 10 years behind razor wire tucked in his memory what happened. Agree in unison that prison will turn the brain into a hum. Agree again that prison taught you to be a better criminal, though you both digress. 
Both of you understand the term anomaly, but it meant that disco was a composite of many men who never learned to be a man. You would then ask yourself the question for the first time, why? Return back home to New Haven before rush hour traffic begins to bottleneck the Cross County Parkway. Dig through the closet for the first version of your memoir. Disco roll the safe out of the department store, the first lines of the paragraph read. Go to the next page where he loves to pull the torso of a gun more than he loves touching the torso of a woman. Flip to the page where he and his sister distribute lead bullets through the windshield and the oppressions of the circular holes when the discarded lead pierce the glass are swift and pronounced. The body is a question mark. He tried to run over the wife with his truck and then threatened her with a claw hammer, she told the police. Ask yourself why this sign didn't signify violence. What theory would Ferdinand de Saussure classify this under? Put the manuscript back in the closet. Don't beat yourself up because you knew he was a killer and said nothing to nobody. Forget the double negative your mom would correct you on and tell yourself it's nature versus nurture. Justify your silence in saying that the world you once lived in was filled with silence and mayhem. That is why they called you Hook. Don't block Audrey Lords. Your silence will not protect you from your mind. Pretend this is penance. Wake up the next morning, go back to the computer, press any key to erase the black screen. Ignore the black birds outside your window while telling yourself this is the last time. You need to forget, but before you do, one more search. Click inmate violent death in the news. A flood of black birds appears suspended in animation at the top right corner of the web page. Ignore them, but then don't. Tell yourself this is not karma, Edgar Allan Poe style. He did not want her to leave. She wanted him to go. Said, she, said he needed treatment. Think back to 12-step literature that cautions about the 13th step, sexual fraternization with people inside the circle. Feel confident in assuming that she was a recovering addict and understood addictive behavior. Two addicts don't make a right. Tell yourself this. Read about the interaction with police who failed to notice the inevitable. Admit the judicial system is failing to protect women. I am victim was tattooed on her forehead, yet she remained invisible to the patriarchs, the ones sworn to protect and serve. Ask yourself, does his death matter more than the victim's death? Convince yourself the race never stops running, that memory would eat you alive. Say, I am a changed man, but no one will hear you. You're back in the bed. Pull the covers over your face. Remember the dream. Forget hook. Wake up tomorrow and feel guilty again. All right. Y'all still with me? Mm -hmm. Nod your head. All right. All right. And so um, I'm going to read one of the letters. I don't usually read a whole lot of them. Sometimes when I when Linda, she's actually the lady, the L, she's actually out of out of prison now, and so um, she has read with me before. But I'm going to read a couple of these that I wrote to her, um, and so you can get a sense of what those were like, and maybe one, one other piece. <clears throat> Dear L, we script our lives on reaction rather than action, meaning daily life is always in response to a reply to a command or demand. The world uses us that way, the after sound of oppression. We know this maxim, yet we become willing participants in our own commodification. The world does this, holds us down. Then too, I've been thinking about the question you pose with regard to women and believing. Perhaps images in how we as a society nurture young women creates this insecurity. The American dream chokes little girls in so much as not all of them will be able to live up to the ideal beauty as constructed by benefactors of the dominant narrative those who dictate the ebb and flow of how we live. Beauty is a dangerous thing, and understand brown and black women historically bear the weight of civilization in addition to their own weight, which can be daunting at times. But more than that, the male plays a, mo a role in this insecurity, especially in these so-called streets, by his rejection of the woman as equal counterpart in anything other than sexual object. We just want to love and have some warm body lovers back. Objectification is a delicate balance. 
In other words, I saw this objectification play out with men who dominated women to the point they broke their spirits and stole their sound. The women couldn't speak of their own oppression because they possessed no language to express the unimaginable, reminding me of pudding in the street walk of sunshine. Sunshine adored pudding so much she strolled around Logan Circle in DC every night selling the one commodity she knew well herself. But here's the, here's the oxymoron. Sunshine never saw the light. Darkness choked her to death. She never got to understand we are the shadows and the dog that Toni Morrison imagines. Our sound originates from the breaking of sound. And then again, like life, language is only the beginning. And perhaps in death, too, comes a new beginning, a new language. L, tonight I am imagining with exact description the six by nine cell you sleep in in all its isolation because this is something memory lets me reinvent. The gray cinder block, the dull silver glow from the metal toilet. I have been thinking long and hard with regard to confinement and the bordering of color and how we as a society imprison ourselves within the complexion of skin as if human survival depends on this one specific thing. Of course, I could make a conscious effort to avoid color or not to invade your personal space when trying to make a parallelisms, but history be, can be unforgiving in how the past reconstructs the future, whether we acknowledge it or, or not. For some reasons, I feel our histories and futures intersect in so much as we come from the same memory. In other words, I have inhabited the cell door claim and I can't escape the image of the pinstripe inmate constructed. There it is, that word, construct, or construction, which is another word for confinement on someone else's terms, a sort of deliberate scaffolding. If I could go back to the initial moment after the formulation of Earth, and I'm talking about the first glorious sunrise after the Big Bang, have you ever wondered what that feeling could have been like? In the beginning, a delayed oceanic swirl, light blue, foilish, light green. You see, color had not begun. If only someone could have stopped progress at that precise moment. Consider the empirical evidence. A two-year-old boy in an apartment eight blocks from the detonation that killed four little girls in the church basement. All the girls wanted to do was sing, and somebody stole their little light of mine. The picture of baby Jesus knocked off the hook, the apartment rattling from the detonation. You see, I heard and felt that echo, a two-year-old boy being constructed to understand black and white, to choose a side. I was a construction before I came of age. For so long, all I could think about was vanishing from prison and realizing I was in prison before incarceration. And you see, I steal language behind invisible bars. I keep asking if this is the totality of my life I keep asking if this is the totality of my life. True, I am on the outside, but my inside is all tangled up still. If life is a sum of history, how can we ever hope to escape this? Whether I choose to acknowledge the box or not, other people will, and there is no escaping this distinction. In other words, allow me to paraphrase Sartre for a moment, who says that once man uttered the word free, man was no longer free because he needed to be identified as free, proving that he was chained. I say I'm free every day, but really, how free am I? Whenever I'm awakened from a nightmare induced by memory, you see it begins with moonlight ends, slipping through the horizontal window, wraps each iron bar of the prison you have become, a long extension of the cell in which all humans are born, coming to the world screen, screen in the high shrill falsetto you never want echoes, ripples, and bangs, the jangling keys, the slow boot heel drag, the black scuff marks. You can't see the guard, and the guard would not see juvenile Johnny curve over the bottom buck like an elegant woman. He is not stopped, but no one will stop. Receding scenarios double over and over and over and over. Picture little Elle, black hair, tangled, rubbing her marble eyes, trying to focus on blood trickling down her father's face, trying to understand domestic violence, and all little Elle knows is love. Again, silence is louder than all sound ever created. 
I was incarcerated twice, so understand, I feel your pain, L. The first time the FBI and Special Task Force, Force had my house under surveillance because of what I had once called a side hustle. According to the FBI, Kingston Files, we were a well-organized crime group with a sophisticated operation of fencing stolen laptop computers. I do not dispute the facts. I admit it was me coming out of an office building in Fairfax County, Virginia, with 10 laptops valued at over $20,000. When the police had finished, the reds and blues and white boy from Clifton Terrace hit the gas and we almost got away until coming out of the parking lot, we were side ran by an armored cruiser. The reds and the blues, and thank God this arrest would not be for the quarter kilo of narcotics stashed in the safe in my room. You see, there's something about these streets that stays inside you like a dormant virus. You can't shake it. It lives with you and in you many ways, and it shapes who you are to become. I don't know if there is a cure, but I do know that one can live with the echo of gunshots fired. The human mass of bodies choked in stairwells, clutching gun handles and crack stems. The dead bodies. We have to turn tragedy into triumph. You could have told me a different narrative, yet this is the one you chose to share, and I consider nothing accidental. I often talk about my father, when I can, whom I consider essential to my maturation as a man in this world. Without him, there is no me. He is my rock. And the memoir I am writing is tentatively titled, Father, Forgive Me. I will be sending you several peaks from the book. Perhaps in this way, you will be able to understand my path to prison and after. I have to write this introduction for my next, for my next year's journal on prison. I know that prison is a difficult mandate in that it must represent a physical place where law and order can be administered. Yet the administrators and the maintenance of such a place places a heavy burden on those who oversee. The elephant in the room is always race, especially when it comes to the disproportionate numbers in terms of demographics within penal institutions. Some question to consider would be, what does the average person who has never been locked up fail to consider when they side with the death penalty, mandatory sentencing, and the outdated methods prisons use? As the leader of the free world, why is America last to address the idea of incarceration? Perhaps I can use your quotes from what I'm wrestling with through my memoir. The biggest thing is to figure out how to enter the essay. So, all right, one more piece. We good? All right. So that was a, a letter to, to Linda, to, to Elle. Um, and it was a response to her to which to something she wrote about um, being inside and on this, trying to figure out why women sometimes often give up and you know and, and a lot of it had to do with placing a lot of weight or a lot of their trust in men too and so that was a sort of response to that um, I'm going to read one more section um, it's called the state 1998 and um, it's about Rocks, I, was, I was incarcerated in the Roxbury Correctional Institution in, um, in Maryland. And so this, there's a section that sort of deals with that. So this is the state, 1998. The reality of Roxbury Correctional, as with any prison, is rooted in the idea you cannot leave by your own free will, the key word being free. Walking from intake and to and across the prison yard, taking in the pristine lawns and clean sidewalks, you get a sense of false security. You could be visiting a gated liberal arts college campus in a rural town, if not for the razor wire circling the complex, but the rock wild is snapping. <laughs> right here, no. <laughs> Kinda. <laughs> But the rock, the rock wild snapping jaws immediately destroy that fantasy. <laughs> a few paces further and the guard tower comes into focus against the backdrop of a cobalt sky. You can't help think about the index finger willing to squeeze the trigger, the scope, barrel, and mirror shades following every inmate's footstep. The first night, 11 p.m., lock-in, instigated a crippling silence in cell 16 until the doors rolled back at 4.30 a.m. for breakfast the first morning. 
ourselves emptied into a stream of human flesh migrating toward the dining hall, which was 100 yards opposite the housing unit. Our bodies blended together effortlessly. We could have been a herd of cattle going to graze. Midway to the entrance with the sun's orange peeking through dawn steel gray, a man moaned and dropped to the ground with a shank protruding from his stomach. Breakfast had to be eating, so we each stepped over the bloody body. I was told it would take about two years before the judge would hear my motion for reconsideration. After I, after I received the maximum sentence on four felony counts, my court-appointed lawyer submitted the request before I was transported upstate with caution against any hope of an earlier release. Before I left upstate, Pat Parker called me into her office in the county jail and asked me to not stop writing. She thought I had talent. No one had ever told me this, but more than that, Bonnie Boswell, who ran, who ran the jail addiction services program, said if I agreed to participate in a two-year program in North Carolina, she might be able to persuade the judge to commute my sentence and have my time and have me placed there. In the meantime, I try to remember every bit of advice given to me in county jail by the old heads, the ones in and out of prison so frequently acquired, they acquired invaluable knowledge. Definite no-nos were don't borrow nothing from nobody. Don't jump the line, any line. Be respectful of the phone and a man's religion. Don't get caught in a lie. You steal and get caught, you can lose your life. Always keep your sneakers on because you may have to fight at any moment. Don't fight fair. Don't get pumped or you may be somebody's pump. Always keep a shake close by and don't be afraid to use it. If you are, again, you may die. Let me see, I don't want to read all, I'm trying to skip around. Here we go. Night, a deafening silence filling every inch of the housing unit, every stir amplified by the isolation of a closed cell door. The beat thump begins simple enough, that intense percussive call, go-go, drawing on West African influences, the indigenous music of the District of Columbia. Two doors down in cell 19, Josephus got go-go fever induced by mail call, after shift change. Five years into an eight year bid, his girlfriend who stayed in the Clifton Terrace informed him she would no longer vigil the memory of his street heroics. His image had faded from DC's landscape, and so was she. There was no question the right fist was ball driving the cadence like a conductor calling out to a crew of Gandhi dancers laying eight foot railroad track. Get a grip in your hand, whoa, now work with the chillin', whoa. The left hand, palm open, balanced the driving narrative of gut bucketed pain, much like a morning does citrus spikes into the crossfire. Let it swing on down. Whoa, now. <coughs> a combination of spirituals, blues, work songs, and field hollers. Joseph was bang, pulling each man onto the edge of his bunk to listen to the coded message thump on a metal desk, doubling as a hymnal. For five minutes, he held us hostage with the same beat. The same goddamn beat, exhibiting how written language can kill the human spirit. Then he released us to a much faster, more complicated syncopation, the reverberated, the reverberated echo unique to each man's current temperament. So we each wallow long and hard in that temperament. If it were not for the razor wire blocking him, if it were not for the razor wire blocking him, Josephus would have broke, broken into a sprint, scaled the fence and evaporated into the known world, but he couldn't. And in the process of this revelation, he concentrated harder on each individual thump, careful to press sorrow into the low note while the high one reprieved, offering everybody in C tier testimony on how a woman done him wrong. Reality dictated that I too would soon get a Dear John letter from Beanie, my girlfriend who had been convicted and sentenced to 18 months in Montgomery County. There was a helplessness in the way Josephus banged misery, which receded as each, as each minute elapsed. When the elegiac rhythm ceased, the slow drag boot heel of the night shift guard replaced the vacated noise. She slowly made her rounds, pointing the flashlight into each cell to make sure everyone was present and accounted for. When the strong beam of light pierced into my cell, I was on the edge of my bunks with a roll of cigarette dangling from my lips. Thank you.
Thank you, Randall. That was amazing. Um, mark your calendars, you guys. A week from today, February 28th, Story Collider is going to be here. Listening, you'll be able to listen to Denison professors telling true stories about science. In the meantime, it is my pleasure to introduce Charles Boyer, who is the winner of the Great Lakes College's Award for Fiction. Um, I had the honor of serving as one of those three judges Peter was mentioning earlier. And so um, I couldn't be happier that the book that I had top of my list was the one that won. The honor is most deserved, as you will see. History's Child, as the title suggests, is a historical novel that tells the story of a young boy named Tadek Gradinsky, born in 1931 in a village in what was then Eastern Poland. The novel opens at the moment that Tadek's childhood is torn apart, first by the 1939 Soviet invasion from the East, then by the 1941 Nazi invasion from the West, and ultimately by the repressive grip of Stalin that sends Tadek into the Gulag, that vast system of prison camps, and subsumes his Polish homeland into the Soviet Republic of Belarus. If this sounds a little confusing, that's because it is. This is a part of the world where the borders between nation states and empires have been drawn and redrawn and redrawn. As it happens, I have some family members who grew up um, about 100 kilometers from the village that the character of this novel comes from in what was once Lithuania, previously Poland, subsequently the Soviet Union, and when I was little, I could never understand why I couldn't find any of the places my grandfather was from on any map. In those days, it was just this big red blotch called USSR. Um, since the disintegration of the Soviet Union, of course, some of these contested countries have come back. And today, the independent Republic of Belarus is, just to give you some sense, if you ever look at a map, sandwiched between the Ukraine to the north, to the south, rather, Lithuania and Latvia, the Baltics to the north, Russia over to the east, and Poland to the west. Historical novels are perennially popular and notoriously challenging to write. The British novelist David Mitchell has said that he's drawn to what he calls, quote, the challenge and perverse pleasure of tackling the pitfalls of the historical novel, the foremost of which is research. Filmmakers, Mitchell writes, ruefully observe how every decade back in time a film is set, X million dollars gets added to the production costs. The same principle applies to historical novel writing, but instead of dollars, read months. To the reader, of course, the pleasures of a historical novel are manifold. Historical fiction delivers what Mitchell calls a stereo narrative. From one speaker comes the treble of the novel's own plot, while the other speaker plays the base of history's plot. It illuminates the contemporary world in ways straight history may not. History's Child not only won the Great Lakes College's New Writers Award, but also the AWP Award for the novel. In her judge's note, author Mary Gateskull says, History's Child is very much about Poland and Belarus and the spirit of those that live there. However, it is also very much about people anywhere and everywhere trying to maintain humanity however they can in a world of gross power and abuse. As such, it is something that we, as citizens of what is still the most powerful country in this world, would do well to pay attention to. And that was written a couple years ago, so all the more relevant today. History's Child reveals more vividly than a history book what it means to remain a moral human being in face of totalitarian power and brutality. These are questions of our times. This is a novel that reminds us of the power of fiction to teach us empathy, and to help us understand how precarious freedom truly is. Charles Boyer teaches English and Humanities at Montserrat College of Art in Beverly, Massachusetts. He holds a BA from Beloit College and an MA in Fiction Writing from the, from the University of New Hampshire. His chapbook of poetry, The Mockingbird Puzzle, was published in 2007. And my own online stalking reveals that he, although he has long been a New Englander, he grew up in a small town in Illinois plays the saxophone, by his own account, loudly and poorly, and has a rescue terrier schnauzer mix named Oliver in honor, of course, of Oliver Twist. Please join me in welcoming Charles Boyer. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, 
Yeah, Randall uh, used the phrase escaping history, and I think uh, that's a very pertinent phrase. I think uh, in some ways my book, History's Child, is about uh, attempts to escape history and its impossibility. Um, it's about um, a time of uh, tribal identities, individual identities, scapegoating, us versus them thinking, polarized ideologies, in short, a time just like ours. So uh, human nature doesn't change, and um, we're still dealing with many of the same things. Um, I don't think um, Margot mentioned that it's based on my wife's father's uh, true story. Perhaps she did. Um, I, uh, I visited there in Belarus, it used to be Poland, and I, just the, uh, the locale, the geography, the, the village, and the, uh, and the river, and uh, the sense of history. There were bullet holes in their uh, house from the German invasion. My wife, as a child, had found a, a, a saber from the Napoleonic Wars in her backyard. Um, I'd read a lot of, uh, of Tolstoy, et cetera, so I had a, a just, it just sent shivers up and down my spine, just the, uh, the sense of all that had happened there and the need to, uh, to record it in some fashion. I'm gonna read three sections. Uh, this is from chapter one, The Patriarch. August 1939, Eastern Poland. As soon as Zygmunt Belyowski heard of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, pledging peace between Stalin and Hitler. He went to his barn to fetch six canning jars full of his homemade apple vodka and drank all of two and most of the third before he passed out beneath the ancient oak tree across the street from his house. His daughter and her husband had to come and haul him to bed, shaking their heads at his absurd reaction to a piece of paper concerning two distant scoundrels. But he was right and they were wrong. Zygmunt was a lean, hulking man with a heavy limp and high, knobby shoulders. He had high cheekbones and an aquiline nose, and his eyes stared out unsettlingly from beneath gloomy brows. He'd been the local blacksmith when he was younger, and his forearms and hands seemed unnaturally hard and sinewy, even when he was into old age. But he determined early on that no one ever got rich sweating over a forge. For a decade, with every hammer blow of the anvil, he thought of the land he would buy, the plan he gradually set into motion as he began to purchase, lot by lot, the marshy strip along a stream north of the town that ran into the Neiman River. By the time he was 60, his plan consumed his every waking moment. The long-term plan, which he kept deliciously secret, was to set up a private ferry where once years before had been a bridge burnt in retribution after some futile uprising against the Tsar. The land, now useful only to beavers and storks, would surely become valuable once the ferry turned the road away from Grodna, siphoning off traffic on a more direct Baltic route than the Neiman River, which wound its way beneath the bluff at the edge of the village. Suspicious of Jews, he nevertheless admired what he considered their acumen in affairs of the world. He frequently trekked the 10 kilometers into Grodna to argue and do business, consulting so often with Lebni Reznikov the owner of a t textile shop and an occasional investor, that it was difficult to tell animus from friendship. Besides, he respected Levy's opinion and his devotion to his family, and often forgot to hold against him the peculiar liability of being born a Jew. As Zygmunt drank shot after shot of vodka slumped beneath the oak tree, it brooded over the wisdom of the Jews. Levy had always told him, keep your assets liquid, and he'd been right, they knew. Zygmunt had always said, land, land, you must have land. And Levy just sat back and sipped his tea and shook his head. They knew better than to trust in land. Especially, they knew better than to trust the governments of the world. Zygmunt woke up from his first wave of drunkenness only to resume his assault on the remaining jars of vodka, finishing the last just as on September 1st, a week after he started his drunk, Hitler invaded Western Poland. A wave of nauseating sobriety and clarity swept over him. He'd been right, and he was ruined. He staggered to the barn only to discover that his daughter had removed the rest of the vodka catch, which he thought had been well hidden. First, he cursed his daughter, but knowing his pleas would not move her, 
He began searching for a few more hidden jars, for there were levels beyond levels to his secrets. And he'd hidden more vodka for just such an emergency. Unfortunately, the inspiration to hide liquor commonly visited him just as he achieved the peak of his drunken state. Often he couldn't remember the hiding place afterwards, and so he cursed himself in turn. Two weeks later, after Zygmunt had returned to excruciating full sobriety, Stalin invaded eastern Poland. With new determination, Zygmunt now tore through the house and barn and the back buildings, find, finally finding a few jars of alcohol on a shadowy ledge an arm's length down the wall up with, and perched on a rafter in the barn loft up with the pigeons. Sipping gratefully, he collected apples and fired up his still to make certain he couldn't be cut short again. He was determined to follow his drunk through to its natural ending, since he, controlled nothing else, he could control nothing else in the world. Seated on a stool beside his homemade distillery in Lyoski, he could hear the, bar the bombardment of Grodna 10 kilometers away. The repeated drinking bouts to escape the calamities of politics ended for Zygmunt with a stroke. From his bed where he lay, the right side of his body paralyzed, he could hear the pounding of the Red Army and reinforcements marching through the streets of Lyoski on their way to Grodna. <clears throat> That's the grandfather, uh, Tadek. The grandson is the main uh, character. And this is a few years later with uh, Tadek and his uh, best friend, Pavel, <clears throat> after the uh, Germans had invaded, um, <clears throat> they invaded Poland at first, and then two years later, they, they invaded uh, the Soviet Union, <clears throat> Soviet-held uh, Poland. This is called Football and Trains. That summer, Tadek and Pavel and their friends spent every free moment playing football in the open field across the tracks and behind a thin wall of birches from the train station. The Germans had banned all of their organized clubs, but the soldiers ignored the kids in the field. So after their chores, before or after their intermittent schooling, between long hours sometimes spent in the field, they would chase the ball up and down the hard-packed ground till sweat flushed in sheets down their sides and dripped into their eyes. At breaks, they would wander over to the water pump closer to the station. Usually, the guards would ignore the boys when they slipped through the birches to get a drink of the perfect crystal liquid, which they sipped from a dented tin cup hung on a hook by the pump. Other times, the guards would become possessive and chase away the boys, especially if a train was in the station. The boys were used to troop trains headed east going by while they were playing football. The Germans could be put in the background of life. When you were rushing down the field with the football rolling before you, jittering over pebbles, with the defenders shadowing alongside you. But one day, a different type of car stopped at the station. This train was headed west, and the engine pulled six stock cars, one troop car full of soldiers, and then the caboose. Guards were posted atop each car. The boys stopped playing to watch as the guards went to the first car and threw the door open on a jumbled tangle of humans. From the darkened doorway of the stock car, the boys could feel dozens of gazes upon them where they stood silently watching. The guards gave orders, and two ragged men got down from the car and took a metal bucket toilet around to the side of the train where they dumped it. Same chore was repeated in the next car. To the third car, the guards had the prisoners bring a wheelbarrow into which they shoved a man's body from out of the car. Then another body, a woman's, made to balance precariously on top of the first one. The boys stood watching in silence. The prisoners wheeled the corpses around the train, and as the boys stepped around to watch, loaded them in the back of a truck, which promptly drove away. What's that? I don't know. It's Jews. They're Jews. The next day, there was another such train. The day after that, another one. One day, the train stopped while the boys were drinking water from the pump near the tracks. Most of the other boys finished drinking and kicked the ball down the tracks, moving away from the train. Most of the guards, too, had moved away to the other side of the train, supervising the emptying of the latrine and the removal of corpses, if need be. Tadek and Pavel stood alone at the pump, were maybe 20 meters away 
the last train car sat with a tangle of hands and arms waving out of a high, small opening, crisscrossed with barbed wire. Taddock finished drinking from the tin cup and passed it to Pavel, who pumped the handle and, the water gush, and let the water gush out, overfilling the cup. From the dimness of the car, the haggard faces of men stared at them, the sunken faces of women, sunken eyes of women, water, someone called. The call was echoed by another. A dozen arms waved through the small opening like some sort of many-armed god. Faces pushed at the openings, mere slits between boards. One woman's eyes caught Taddock's, and he could tell her look also caught Pavel's eyes. Pavel was standing with a tin cup in his hand, staring across at the train full of prisoners. He filled the cup again and stood for a while, staring, forcing a confused laugh out of Taddock. As if overcome by some force, Pavel started to move toward that woman's eyes, the cup still in his hands. He stepped over the first set of tracks in a slow, somnambulatory walk. Cry of water, water, had become general. Pavel kept plodding, oblivious to everything but the cries from the cars. Tadek saw that two guards had noticed Pavel's approach to the car. Pavel, Tadek called, but Pavel ignored him. Pavel! Pavel stumbled on over the tracks. Tadek ran up behind Pavel. The two guards were running towards him down the tracks. Tadek grabbed him by the arm, jerking at the cup and spilling the water. A tortured cry of disappointment came up from the car. Tadek pulled Pavel by the arm, turning him around, trying to hurry him away from the railroad car. The soldiers were upon them. One smashed the butt of the rifle into the cup, knocking it out of Pavel's hands. String verboten. Taddock kept pulling on Pavel's arm, leading him away from the soldiers, who now stood, a bit indecisively, watching the boys retreat. On the other side of the trees, the rest of the boys swarmed around Pavel and Taddock. What were you doing? I don't know. I just wanted to give them water, I guess. You know you can't do that. It's just one cup of water. Taddock was astounded by his friend. Didn't he know what the situation was here? A sort of strange, idealistic world had infested his friend's mind. Taddock looked at the side of Pavel's unhappy face as if he might read answers to these questions there. Signs were posted in the town square, and the loudspeakers told them every day, to help a Jew is punishable by death. It was against the law for a Pole to talk to a Jew. Tears were welling in Pavel's eyes. One guard, having made up his mind that more action was needed, pursued the kids down the rail line, up the slight rise, and through the trees, waving his arms at them, shouting at them in angry German, the words incomprehensible, the meaning unavoidable. As a group, the boys sullenly retreated, step by step, as he pursued them into the clear, until it was clear that he wanted them gone from their football field. The group broke up, and the boys returned to the village streets. Thanks, Karposevich, said one of the older boys, one of the better players, respected by all. They probably won't let us play here anymore. All that for the Jews. Pavel hung his head. Tadek could tell it hurt to lose face before the older boys. Tadek felt himself turned around by swirling currents that he felt sometimes in adult conversations between his parents and his uncles. The suffering of the Jews, the contempt of the older boys, Pavel's instinct to help, the brutality of the Nazis, all pulled and twisted on him like currents of the river during spring rain. A clattering sound came from behind them. The train was starting to pull away from the station. All the boys were glad to see it go. Taddock walked Pavel home, feeling bad for him. He shook his head at Pavel's naivete. How could he think of doing such a thing? Everyone had known where Pavel was headed with a tin cup of water. But Taddock had pulled him back before he had actually offered it to the Jews, and this permitted the Germans to overlook the seriousness of what he had done. Pavel walked slowly, his eyes at his feet, evidently ashamed of his behavior. And this is a couple of years later um, when the Russians are coming back. The father, <coughs> the father has been taken into uh, Germany as slave labor. Um, so Operation Bagration is the name of the German invasion, or the Russian invasion of Germany, and <clears throat> our way back. <clears throat>
Summer 1944, um, Christina is Tadek's uh, mother's name. Um, Tadek heard voices at the gate to the street before it crashed open. They smashed through the latch. From the window, he saw three Russian soldiers in their khaki green tunics and cloth caps with high black boots striding boldly into their yard. Up the path under the shadowy grape arbor they came, two of them, rifles swinging from their shoulders, continuing into the sun past the house to the barn and the hen house. The third came to kick against the door. Tadek stood behind his mother as she went to meet him. Do you have anything to eat? He asked in Russian, a language Tadek had heard when he was younger, but now not for years. We have to feed ourselves, she replied, also in Russian. The language sounded extraordinary, coming from his mother's mouth though he'd known she could speak it a little. We have liberated you. Now we have to be fed. The soldier's eyes ran up and down Christina. A loud squawking came from around the corner of the house, and Christina ran out to see the other two soldiers coming back from the hen house, each holding a wing-batting hen upside down in one hand. Christina and Tadek had just recently managed to trade honey for two new chickens with the hope that these chickens would put an end to their hunger. What are you doing, Christina said. Put those back. You want us to starve? The men stopped and grinned stupidly at her, both giving her the same slow, raunchy look up and down. Christina hit one on the chest and tried to grab back a chicken. He laughed and hit it behind himself, and together they turned in a circle, with him laughing and her swearing and reaching for the chicken. She stopped when the soldier, for, when the first soldier stepped in and she bumped up against his chest, his unshaven face close to hers, his ravenous eyes suddenly quite serious. She stepped back as he edged closer. Hey, Anison, the kid, the other gestured with his head. Tadek stood in the doorway with a hatchet in his hand. He couldn't even recall turning into the mudroom and grabbing the hatchet out of the corner. The man just gave Tadek an empty glance. He might have been looking at a boot alongside a road. Another soldier, an officer by the red star on his cap, stepped through the gate and stood in the shadows of the grape arbor. Come on, he called. You, no more of your nasty tricks. Save it for the Fräuleins in Berlin. Bring the chickens. Grinning, the three men began backing away down the lane their eyes still on Christina. But as soon as one turned his back, she lunged forward and, grabbing a chicken by its legs, jerked it out of the surprised man's grip, turning and running away several feet, scowling. This is ours. Come on, the officer called again. The soldier, who'd lost the chicken, cursed and took a step toward her, then laughed abruptly. He retreated with the other two down the pathway, tilting his head back, and laughing to the sky, a bit hysterical. We'll be back, little rabbit, he tossed over his shoulder. We'll be back. Lock the gate behind them, Tadek. Wire it shut. And what's this? She gestured to the hatchet in Tadek's hand. He thought she might scold him, but she just nodded. All right, then. You're ready. We'll slaughter this chicken now so no one else has a chance to take it. Her tone was light, but when she tried to steady the chicken's head, with calming strokes. Her hands were shaking so badly that she finally thrust the bird and hatchet into Tadek's hands. You do it. Thanks. <laughs>